As today's video is going to feature the Orthodox Church as well, at least one of them, possibly be talking about more than one, that backdrop should make sense as we go on. Now, the late Sir Terry Pratchett had a concept he called the truth for a given value of the truth. Over at History Debunked, one of Simon's regulars, David 1964, who seems to wind up the regulars with, well, great regularity, has a similar concept, which he's called the Loughton Truth, or you could call it the Loughton Lie. Um, and here's a great example of such a concept in reality. Much of what Simon's going on about in this video is true. However, it lacks context and the background. And without that, it assumes an entirely different dimension. Let's listen to him. And I have some historical bits and bobs to give you as it goes on. Hello again. After the end of the Second World War, with much of London's East End destroyed by the Blitz, the new Labour government began building various new towns. True, many of which became something of a joke, especially Milton Keynes, uh, which became a joke uh, as one of the most boring places in the world. Possibly unfair, but it became a standing joke, but go on. Some of which would be populated by former Londoners. Harlow New Town in Essex was one such. On the edge of Loughton, also in Essex, a huge housing estate was built on open country. It was called Debden, and in the late 1940s and early 1950s, many East Enders moved to it. The railway station of Chigwell Lane was renamed Debden and became part of the London underground system. Thus far, nothing terribly controversial, but let's keep going. That was pretty much how Debden remained for the next half century or so until I moved here in 1999. I felt right at home here because, of course, these were all people like my own family who were from the East End. I <clears throat> had a grandmother in right, Before I go on, uh, some viewers have noticed that coffin are going, it's disgusting. It doesn't look great, I'll say that, but more worryingly, I'm hoping it's been retreated, despite our altercations and the fact that I find much of what you have to say, Mr Webb, disturbing and worrying and not a great look for Britain or humanity in general. That cough is very serious, whatever's going on down there. Take it to the doctor post-haste. One uncle in Dagnam, another in Hall Church, and my mother's family had moved to the Beckentry estate when it was built. For me, Debden was like coming home. That has all changed now. Here are a few random instances of the changes that I've seen. Round the back of St Nicholas Church on Rectory Lane, there was a run-down little sports hall. This was very busy in the evening, full of children and teenagers. It was a great way for children to occupy their time. It was something, somewhere for them to go. They did trampolining there, gymnastics and fencing. It was a perfect community resource. Yes, there were many church halls and, and halls connected with communities. Some of them have gone out of business over time, lack of money, lack of interest, changing culture, and kids changing their interests. But go on. Then one day it was claimed that asbestos had been found in the roof. It closed down and almost immediately caught fire. It never... Re At almost immediately. No timeline, I notice. When, what's almost immediately? A week? Six months later, a month later. Now he goes on, as you'll see. Open, but was somehow sold to a property speculator. And a care home was built on the land. This is owned by Indians and staffed by Africans. You see them come. Now, property speculators are something I might actually agree with, Mr. Webb, are a pain in the ass, but they're certainly not just Indian. They come from all sorts of backgrounds. You'll find them from everywhere in the world in the Jewish, Greek, Irish, Russian, you name it. The country has property for speculators. They proliferate like little bugs, buying up things, renting them out, um, making cheap flats, doing rack renting, etc., etc. It's uh, also Mr. Webb seems to veer between uh, bigging up Indians and insulting them. It's a kind of strange back and forth on them he's developed. 
coming from the tube station in the morning. The Church of St Nicholas is a lovely old country church which used to be owned by the Church of England. It's part of Old England because in the graveyard is buried Sarah. It still is owned by the Church of England, in fact. We'll be coming back to that. And we'll be coming back to what Mr Webb's talking about here and we'll also be coming back to issues around the Martin, church. Martin, who wrote the nursery rhyme, Old Mother Hubbard. A few years ago, the Church of England handed over St Nicholas to the Romanian Orthodox Church. We'll see why that's a mis overstated claim in a bit. And now every Sunday, Rectory Lane is full of huge flashy cars parked bumper to bumper. They evidently liked the look of the area once it started coming. You would think, wouldn't you, that a man who identifies Christian faith as a, a big part of culture and goes on about worshipping loads of churches will be happy to see people worship. But come back, let's come back to St Nicholas Church. In fact, what is there right now is a memorial chapel not a church as such. It is a place of worship, but author shines. This is by a local historian who lives in Loughton as well. Author shines a light on St. Nicholas Church, Loughton, which is billished for £80. And I also have a rather more academic article on a similar theme, which I'll read a short amount from. The shameful story of a medieval church's ill fated demolition has been told by the author of a new book. The history of St. Nicholas Church Loughton has been written by Epping Forest Conservator and local historian Richard Morris to tell the story of the late lost church and its importance to the town today. St. Nicholas was Loughton's original parish church, built in the 16th century on the site of today's grade uh, two list of 1946 Memorial Chapel in Tree Lane, Loughton. Skipping past that annoying Star Trek advert. Today, little remains of the old building other than an outline of the foundations and gravestone slabs that had formed part of the floor. Morris describes the church as a small but attractive building, which was probably the second to have been built on the site. Constructed in the second, 16th century, it was placed close to the ancient Loughton Hall for the convenience of the, Lord, convenience of the Lord, a common practice for churches built in this era and earlier. However, when the hall was destroyed by fire hundreds of years later in 1836, it followed the seed for the loss of St. Nicholas. With the population growth in the village a mile to the north, along the high road from London to Newmarket, the vestry decided to demolish the church in what Morris calls a shameful and ill-timed spirit of economy. Quite possibly was. Um, you'd, I think I'd probably have to look at the, uh, the records of the time, but I could certainly see it might well have been. I certainly agree it wasn't it probably looking back, it probably wasn't a good idea to destroy what was a piece of irreplaceable history. St. Nicholas was torn down, demolished by the highest bidder who claimed the materials would raise £250 for the construction of the new St. John the Baptist, which is now Church Lane, and we'll be coming back to that church in a minute as well. When it came to the sale, the bidder had wildly overestimated and only £80 was raised. Let's skip down a bit further. This is what there is there now. A memorial chapel stands on the site of the demolished St. Nicholas Church. It's not very big. It's quite small. And I doubt the Romanian contingent of worshippers going in there is that big. But anyway, here's a history of the County of Essex, Volume 4, Loughton Churches. This is a much more in-depth sort of um, waffly academic thing with all sorts of bits about re rents and and so on, and documents in detail. I'll include it anyway, although I think it may people may find it a bit dull, but you never know, there might be someone out there who finds it interesting. And this is the Church of England's heritage record, and that's St Nicholas inside. And as you can see, it's not particularly huge. It's not gigantic by any means. It's a smallish sort of church, or well, memorial chapel to be more exact. It's a place of worship, but it's a memorial chapel meant to memorialise a previous place of worship, really. You can see it's got a plaque on the wall. I suspect that's probably a plaque telling you about that or about the family of the people who erected the original. Got the colours of, I suspect that may be a reg those may be regimental or county colours over the corner. I'd have to stand there to be sure, but it's obviously still used. 
And I can't really see the issue about oh, some Romanians worshipping there, but they didn't hand it over. It doesn't belong to them. Here are the minutes from a, a St. John's meeting from the church. And this is from, let's see, the 13th of September, 2023. The future of St. Nicholas, Rectory Lane. Let me highlight it. The rector reported it was in discussions with Father Sergei of the Romanian Orthodox Church about the future of St. Nicholas Church. In the meantime, the Parish County Council, I presume that's what PCC is for, is asked to note that the annual rental charge charged to the Romanian Orthodox Church for the use of St. Nicholas has been increased from £8,400 per annum to £9,360 per annum, with effect from 1st of January 2024, noted. So it's it's rented. It hasn't been handed over as such. None of this is being told to you by Simon, of course. And here's from St. John's Loughton's website. Where is St. Nicholas? St. Nicholas Church is a small and intimate private chapel built at the site of an earlier parish church. So if Simon would like to go and argue with St. John's at Loughton that he's more correct than they are about the, what the status of this is, feel free. And for the most, it's not used for Anglican worship, and Anglican should be capitalised, but used by our friends in the, uh, the Romanian Orthodox community. Someone looks like they couldn't stop typing it there. To be fair about it, the people who type up these websites, and I know from my own church, are, are chap parish minutes are often elderly people doing it out of the goodness of the heart. So perhaps I shouldn't take the mickey too much. They often have their limitations, and the fact they're doing it free of charge should be borne in mind. But let's return to the end of Webb's video. To the uh, church. And now it's as common to hear mothers speaking to their young children in Romanian here, is it? Wow, Romanian mothers speaking to her, to her children in Romanian. You would think she'd want to preserve some aspect of her culture. Strange, that. <laughs> you would think, for example, if you were Jewish and you were bringing up kids, you'd want to tell them about Judaism in the same way that my parents wanted to tell me about Catholicism, about my own heritage. Strange this. Doesn't mean you you can't assimilate. I assure you, two generations later, the kids will probably know a smack the next generation will probably know a smattering of Romanian words and no more. Or little bits and pieces. Webb himself speaks several languages and has lived in several lands, so he's putting himself in an odd place by doing this one. He identifies himself in the next video as living in Sweden and he's lived in Israel as well. So I, I've, I've kind of seen double standards flying on this one. It is in English, locally. In the street where I live, all the recent property sales have been to either Romanians, Bulgarians or Pakistanis. And are they bothering you? Do they come and attack you in your house? Do they, they make you go to divine liturgy with them, the Romanians and Bulgarians, and drag you down there and do chants or Akathis to the Virgin? I severely doubt that, then. Afghan refugees have moved into some housing association properties which were built on the old college car park. So the sight of women in hijabs is now not uncommon. They're certainly not going to be attending the Romanian divine liturgies in that small memorial chapel. I think it's fair to say that on Debden Broadway in the mornings now, the number of white English people has probably fallen below. So Romanians and Bulgarians are not white suddenly. 50%. In the little play park on Vectory Lane at the end of Newman's Lane, one seldom hears English spoken these days. Why the hell is a grown man standing around a, a playground listening to what mummies are talking to their kids in, in what language? I have to say that sounds decidedly odd. You know, it's, it sounds a bit off, to say the least, to listen to that. The idea that you know... I just walk through the car through the park when kids are playing with their. I don't. I don't really stop and go. Oh look, there that mummy's talking to her kids in Italian. That one's doing Spanish. That one's doing German. Not really my business. As long as the kids are are, are behaving themselves reasonably well and not bothering passers by, it's not my business. If I walk up the road right now and take a twenty or thirty minute walk, I'll end up at Stamford Hill where I'll find a load of mummies and kids playing on. 
Clapton Common speaking Yiddish on my business. Not remotely. Nothing to do with me. The kids behave themselves and aren't bothering me. That's all I'm interested in. They're just having a nice day out with their family. That's... What is this bizarre obsession with kids speaking another language with their mummies and families in a in a play park? It's odd. African carers from the old people's home go there to hang out when they're supposed to be taking old people out in their wheelchairs. They occupy the only bench there so that mothers can't sit down. Well, then go and pressure the council to build some more. Build benches. And they chat away to each other in Yoruba. The mothers using the place are mostly Romanian. It's very rare to hear English spoken in that park now. As I point out, if you wait till the next generation, you'll probably hear a mixture. In generation three, you'll probably hear less Romanian spoken, or you'll probably hear a mixture of languages, because the kids will marry people from all sorts of other places. That's life. You come, keep making a big thing of coming from the East End. The East End was always full of communities who could speak other languages and always full of enclaves of people who spoke other languages. It wasn't some sort of homogenous society down here. There were always Jews, Poles, annoying Irish gits like myself. Uh, we were always there. There was always people like that. You're presenting a kind of a homogenized view of the East End as Cockney geezers or something. It wasn't really like that. From being somewhere I felt completely at home in, a place where I had a common heritage with the neighbours, shopkeepers and churchgoers, Debden has slowly but inexorably turned into a foreign town. I cannot see in what possible way this... Well, Simon, you yourself have stressed that you have no problem worshipping in all sorts of churches and, and other places of worship in all sorts of places of the world. Why don't you pop along to the memorial chapel and enjoy a divine liturgy and see what you find of interest in it? You might find that the Romanian people aren't going to eat you up if you walk in there. It is an improvement on the way it was 25 years ago, and I would be curious to know what the advantages might be for us. We were not consulted. Why would you be? Why should there be some great consultation of people moving around? They're not terrorists moving in or, you know, child killers. They're just families moving into a town. Ridiculous nonsense, this. There should be some cult consultation because some Romanian families buy a house and go to church. Ludicrous tripe. Nobody knew this was going to happen. Debden is not, of course, an exception. Across the whole of Britain, similar towns and cities are being systematically changed and turned into foreign districts, and it's considered bad manners even to mention this, lest one be accused of racism or xenophobia. No, it's just called the fact that the world's got smaller with a, a modern world where people move around and live in other places, come and go, and that's it. You, are, you can either accustom yourself to the fact that the world is changing or not, but it, it was not going to go backwards. No one's going to get the clock, and it's not going to go backwards. Romanians and Bulgarians are, by and large, the most of them I've worked with, and that's a hell of a lot of Romanians and Bulgarians by my age, decent people. I've met a few idiots. I've met quite a few idiots who are English, and quite a few are Irish as well. If you treat most people respectfully and talk to them politely, they'll do the same. If you start characterizing them as people in flashy calls who like um and putting them into little groups in your head, of course. They'll feel that off you. They'll feel that attitude off you when you start to talk to them. They'll feel they'll be that and they won't want to deal with you. I wouldn't. Is it xenophobic though? That on a Sunday afternoon yes. <laughs> to know I'm in the back garden. I would prefer to hear people in neighbouring gardens speaking English rather than... Why are you listening to people in neighbouring gardens anyway? You have a listening post up there going, oh, what they're going on in that garden they're in. Absolutely ludicrous. Nice. I speak several languages, so if you... I don't have a garden, but if I sat outside the front door or if I went for a walk, you'd hear me swap between numerous languages and you'd hear me swap around depending on who I was speaking to. 
of what I was talking about because some languages will be easier to hold a conversation. If you chose to tell me you'd rather hear me speak language English, I'd be sure to tell you something very choice in in Russian, Ukrainian, Yiddish, or another language I know, and it wouldn't be very polite because my message to you would be butt out and mind your own business. The Urdu or Romanian? Is that really a definition of xenophobia? Is it odd that I want to live in a place where people speak the same language as I do? You mentioned you speak several languages. Well, Web. Many people in Europe speak more than one language and swap between them. This idea of monolingual societies is a particular obsession I found with England. It doesn't really carry through to other places in the world. It seems to be some sort of bizarre obsession here in England. People find it a bit odd in other places, in fact. Is that an exclusively English thing, or do you think people in Hungary or Nigeria feel the same way? No, they find that people generally should know the main language of the country primarily, but have no problem using other languages. And if you're going to use Nigeria, you're on a sticky wicket there, as Nigeria has more languages than I've had at dinners, as you're well aware, because you've mentioned it yourself in the past. This more bizarre and strange, strange harking after a past, I don't think was ever really as full of rosy tinge memor memorialization uh, to, 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 to use a word appropriate to this video as Webb suggests it was. And you will notice with those links to bits about the church history, it's rather more complex than he's telling you. Now, I'm sure we'll be off to do another video. Possibly this one will set him off and he'll be running three miles up the road again to tell me, me and others, how this doesn't bother him at all.